most women start a business? Is it passion, money, or freedom? Welcome to Female Founders, the podcast that takes you behind the scene with women who are founders and CEOs to help you start and scale a successful business of your own. I am your host, Nagelia de Ravine. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Female Founders. In today's episode, I will be having a conversation with Catherine Lassioni. Catherine is the founder and CEO of Presenting Perfection LLC. She is a communications coach and college professor with over two decades of experience in media, public relations, and strategic communication. Catherine helps both teens and adults become confident communicators and public speakers. Welcome, Catherine. A pleasure to have you with me today. Good morning, Catherine. Thank you so much for giving me that opportunity to have this conversation with you. And I am so excited to learn more about you and all the great work you have been doing. Well, first of all, thank you for taking the time to meet with me today. It's my honest pleasure and something that I've been looking forward to for a while. So I'm I'm super excited to chat with you. (laughs) I look forward to it. Could you share with us what inspired you to begin a career in communication and public relationships? Sure. So it's it's kind of a, I, I don't know, I've told the story so many times over the years and people always laugh when I tell the inspiration for it. So I was never a really strong math kid. I, but math and science were not my forte, but I was always a really good writer. So when I was in high school, I think it was my first year of high school. So what we used to call freshman year, I was walking up the steps of the science building in my high school. And for some reason, we were talking about life as walking up the stairs to like bio class, which makes no sense. But anyway, so someone asked me, like, so what do you want to do when you grow up? You know, which is like a question, obviously, a lot of high school and college students ask each other. And I said, well, I said, I want to be the editor of Vogue. Right. And this was a really long time ago. So obviously, Anna Wintour is still in that job. She had that job then. She has a job now. But I have always been so I couldn't get it. Um. But I've always been fascinated by journalism and the media and communication. And so for me, although I couldn't be, haven't been on a winter, I still have a complete obsession with fashion and more importantly, an obsession with the way that we as a society communicate with each other, be it between people, be it between people, different cultures, different socioeconomics and kind of, I don't know, just the magic that comes out of the art of everyday conversation. So it was that dream of being the editor of Vogue that propelled me <clears throat> to focus on communications on both an undergraduate and graduate level. So I went to, I was fortunate to, to be able to go to Cornell University and majored in communication. And this was a really long time ago. So back in the day, as we always say, there were two tracks. You could either do um, broadcast or writing, right? So right. And, and to, to get into broadcast journalism, it's, just, it's an incredibly competitive field. And often what you have to do is to go to sort of a, a tier three well, tier three city. So a, a, a less popular market. Um, and I was, I've, I'm from the Northeast. So I've always been loved living kind of between Philadelphia and New York, which is where I was basically grew up and where I live now. So for me, the thought of leaving this part of the country was really tough. Um, and I knew the sacrifice that you had to make to and move out of that area. And I just wasn't willing to do it. So I chose, I, so I chose the, the writing component. Um, both undergrad and grad. And I, it's still today, I love writing. Um, to me, writing is a way of relaxing. Um, I did an article a couple of weeks ago that isn't out yet, but it's on a recent experience that I've had. And it took me like a solid two days to write it and then reflect on it and then go back and edit it. But it was it was very therapeutic. Um, and it was just very refreshing to give myself the time to think and to write. Um, without the pressures of business and, and honestly, without, you know, I'm not a big lover of artificial intelligence, but I know it's become popular, especially in writing and, and I don't use it. And cause I really believe in the importance of, of original thought. Um, and so to give myself the time to write that article and reflect and, and frame my thoughts um, was wonderful. And so it was, you know, to answer your question specifically, again, it was that dream of having that job at Vogue that, got me to focus on communication and it's something that I've enjoyed and, and have not regretted doing at all, I have to say. Hey, you never know. She has to retire at one point of time. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, right? Maybe, maybe. She maybe. can take I it forever. 
hey, and I go to the fashion exhibit every year at the Met that's sponsored by Vogue, right? So that should like give me some credibility for getting that job. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good, actually. Um, but yeah, no, I, uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm fascinated by communication. And I think, you know, just, I, and I'm always a junkie for watching people give speeches on TV or, or you know, give press conferences. And um, I love, the, I love political cycles because I love seeing all the candidates come out and talk. Mm -hmm. And I also love my, my true passion when it comes to communication is learning, right? And I talked about writing, but learning, I love learning. And um, I love going to lections or fireside chats where you get to hear someone talk in a fairly unscripted way because I love seeing how communication enables an individual's personality to really come out. And, you know, I had this experience um, last year, I went to a conference down in, in Washington and saw a bunch of people, um, Nancy Pelosi, um, Kerry Washington and Hillary Clinton, among, among many others speak. And it was amazing seeing them just sit down one-on-one -on -one and just talk. From and the heart, right? From the heart. And they were so incredible. First of all, they were incredibly funny, especially Nancy Pelosi and Hillary Clinton. And, and they were just so real. And I think that when that's the beauty of communication is it really helps us bring out who we are as people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if you're not afraid of being yourself, like there's so much that comes through just a simple conversation like you and I are having now. It, it really enables you to, to, to get a taste of what someone's like and to, to really see how they think, see how they interpret. Um, and I think that's only additive to us as people that listen to these conversations. I, I, I'm always, I always, I go to all these lectures and, and fireside chats and I'm like kind of obsessed with it because I just, I just love learning. Um, and I love learning about people and learning about communities and societies and how we all somehow get along. Um, so it's fascinating stuff to me. We are connected somehow. Somehow we all are connected. And when we get together, it's a huge difference, you know? And I see amazing things happen, especially as women. When we come together, it's yes. like amazing thing happens. And like like you said earlier, not afraid to talk, right? And I, I think even if you are afraid to talk, allow yourself to do it anyway, because you know what happened? Once you start, that's the way the magic happened. Because yes. you continue yes. and your heart start opening. And at the end, you're just going to ask yourself, who the hell am I? <laughs> it's like a whole yes. different person just blow out and just naturally. It is. It is. And it's interesting right now that we're talking about this. So I'm doing some research uh, for a presentation that I'm actually doing this week on the role of, well, it's called leadership, communication, and gender. And it's looking at how female executives can use their communication skills to improve their efficacy as a leader, right? So, and one of the things that, that I did some research into was why we, why women communicate so much differently from men and what the research shows, and this research is out of Ohio State University um, and another uh, group called Social, uh, Social Libra, is that it actually starts on the playground, right? And this is fascinating to me. I could talk to you about this for hours. So basically it starts on the playground in that Boys and girls, so little boys and little girls, have very different play experiences growing up, okay? Yeah. Girls traditionally, this is traditionally, have done things like playhouse, they play with their dolls, they have tea parties, okay? Right. What these are is they're all imaginative, well, they're, they're unstructured, right? There are no rules, there are no roles. Yeah. So what that forces, just because by the nature of the game, little girls to do is to use their imagination to define what those roles and rules are. Okay. And we do, they do that by sharing stories, sharing ideas. Little boys traditionally grew up playing sports or they play cowboys and Indians, right? Where there are roles yeah. and there are defined rules. So the little boy doesn't have to depend upon his imagination as much as the little girl does. So translate that or fast forward to when those little boys and little girls grow up to be men and women in the working world. And women, because we've been forced to use our imagination when we were little, are more likely to tell stories to communicate. And so the type of conversation that we partake in is something called rapport talk, R-A-P-P-O-R-T, which is the French word for you know relationship. 
Men, on the other hand, partake in something called report talk, R-E-P-O-R-T, which is more based upon roles and rules. So the reason that the research, again, what the research says is that we have often this disconnect between the way that men and women communicate isn't something that people are deliberately doing. It's something that starts when we're young and just evolves as we get older. I think it's absolutely fascinating. And when you, right. And it goes, you know, there was that book years ago that was published, um, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, where it very much talks about, you know, how the different genders are so different in their way of communicating. And I know for a lot of women, you know, we often feel like we're being put down by men. And part of that is just in the way that we communicate. Women tend to ask for permission. So yes. the exam, one of the examples that I use in this presentation is a woman will say, so is it okay if we all have a meeting on Friday at 12 o'clock as an example? A man will take that phrase and flip it and say, we're having a meeting Friday at noon. So the woman is asking for permission to make sure it's okay with everyone that's in that room to have that follow-up meeting where the man is just declaring it as a fait accompli. So it, it is fascinating stuff. And the whole point of, of the, res the research that I'm doing in the presentation I'm giving later this week is to, to help you know, women that are C-level or C-1 level develop the skill set to co come across as effective leaders in an authoritative way, but in a way that avoids that terrible B word that we're often all called when we try to exhibit authority. It's, it's, so it's fascinating stuff. So just wanted like, as we were talking about roles and roles and communication and gender, something that I'm like very, very focused on currently actually today um, as, you know, in prepar preparation for this work that I'm doing later this week. That is an amazing uh, research. You should share it with us so we can share it as well. I think uh, especially women would love to read that one. Oh, I absolutely will. Absolutely. I'd love to. How would you know it start from childhood? And you are, uh, you are right about it. If you think if you go back when you were a little kid, a lot of things we used to do. And if you have brothers, like I can compare myself with my brother, it's completely different. Like I never yes. remember hanging out with my brothers doing the exact same thing, unless right. it comes to homework or reading a book or something like that. Well, that's right. And, and even in, in school, right? Tra I mean, it's getting a lot better, thank goodness. But traditionally, there's a focus on, well, what sport will the boy play? Like what sport, right? And the, the girl is just, again, this is traditionally not, it's getting better. But the girl is, is it's okay if she doesn't have a sport. Because it's always been viewed as a boy slash man's world. And again, thankfully, what we're seeing now with, you know, the, the change of, well, the growth with the WNBA with Caitlin Clark and, and, and just, I mean, she's an amazing athlete. You're seeing that, you know, that, that women's sports is going high up on the ladder. And what's, what's another interesting fact with all of this, and again, I could talk about this forever, is when it comes to sports and women's sports, the only sport where women have been paid the same amount as men is tennis. And that has yeah. been for the past, past 50 years. And that's because of Billie Jean King. Otherwise, we have been paid so much less than the men have. But again, women's soccer is not getting paid the same. You know, the WNBA is the women are paid far less than the men. But maybe over time, that'll change. So things are changing, which is great. But we still have a long way to go. But back to the communication thing. Again, this stuff starts at not birth, but it starts when, the, when people, when little kids are really young, like three and four, and it's behavior that just continues over time. So, you know, as much as we may think a guy is being insensitive in his conversation or, or a guy may think that a woman is just being overly chatty, that may be their interpretation, but we have to step back and think about what's the cause. And the cause is not trying to be rude or trying to just ignore the other person's sentiments or feelings. It goes from the way that we were all raised. Now, the other interesting part about this is it's also dependent upon culture, right? So, you know, like I said, I grew up in, in the Northeast. I grew up in Philadelphia specifically. And so, yeah, I mean, I grew up with a sister, you know, we played house, we had tea parties, we played on the swings set in the backyard. It was what it was. But if I had grown up in, in you know, Australia, or if I had grown up in South America, or if I had grown up in Africa or Europe or wherever, maybe the, 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 play, the games that I would have played would have been different. And maybe they would have taught me different things. So it's very hard. You can't just make this statement that it's blanket, that, that this is the reason. But it's just what the research is saying as part of the reason 
there are these communication challenges between gender. It's yeah, just it, kind of how we all grew up. And I think environments have something to do with it as well. The people that surround you every single day, because we model them as, as, ch- as children. I know I model That's my right. grandpa and my mom a lot. And until today, I carry these um, experiences with me. They are not mine. Yes. They belong to my uh, grandpa and my mom. But I use them as example in my own life as values, things that I value, things that I don't value, because I figured that they were doing it and I and I like what they were doing and they stand for something that was worth standing for. So I continue it. So I think that's also yes, a big that's part of it. And another one I, I will add is the fact that I remember when I was a child, uh, a child I cook, I clean. Um, um, I, I have my mom in, the, uh, in her business. I did a lot of things that my brothers didn't have to, they didn't have to do that. But I did. Yes. And that's created when we now as adults, you can see the difference between us, right? Because I have that um, business oriented. I love to cook. I love to clean certain things. And also I, one thing I realized that also helped my communication skills when you're talking about yes. communication, because I get to involve with so many different people. I get to talk with so yes. many different people, even with, within the household. Like, for example, on Saturdays, uh, uh, because I don't have school, it's my day to cook, clean and do laundry. And I yep. would get very angry if my older sister bring boyfriend and sing and don't leave and move their shoes on. And I'm like, no, no, no. And I'll start screaming, I'll start crying, make a huge deal about it. The fact that I spent my entire Saturday cleaning and now you're bringing your boyfriend to dirty the carpet. Yeah. So it was me trying to communicate myself in the best way I think I can with outsiders. And I think that That's also right. make a huge difference as we're growing up. That's right. That's right. Exactly. It, it's a huge difference. And we grow up. And I mean, and, you know, and that also the environment that you grew up in also affects your, your ethics and your beliefs. And, you know, I teach this course on um, interpersonal communication and so on the college level. And so much of what we talk about in this class is like so much of how we were raised, our, what, our parents' beliefs, the school that we went, schools that we went to, or the, t- the teachers that we had, the mentors that we had, the coaches that we had, if we played a sport on, on, the, on the field. All of that influences who we become as people and what our, you know, ethical code, they call it, what our ethical code and what our moral code is. And again, to your point, back to where you grew up, if you grew up in the United States, in the Northeast, you may have a different belief system or ethics system, ethical code than someone who grew up in Texas or someone who grew up in, in Alabama. Just like it's going to be different from someone who grew up in China or someone who grew up in, in you know, South America um, or in South Africa or in Zimbabwe or, you know, name your country. And that's just because of who, where we were and, and who influenced us. Yeah. Um, and, it, and, and, and that's why, you know, you, all, you always hear it's so important to try to listen and embrace what other people are saying. And that's true because. We all come from different perspectives and we may have a a group of shared beliefs, but even those shared beliefs are going to vary by the region of the world that you grew up in. You know, the U.S. is viewed as a very um, communal based society. In other words, that, um, you know, we are a large community, but we're also very I based. So I will do this. I will do that. If you're looking at someplace like um, we'll say China, for example, or some countries in the Middle East. They're a hundred percent community based. So there is no I, it's all we. And that very much influences how people think. So in the US, although, you know, it is the United States of America and we're all supposed to be united, we know that that isn't always the case. We know that, that there are parts of the country that have certain beliefs and other parts that have others. And we know that within that, people are much more I focused, independently focused. And that's just part of this country. But there, again, there are parts of the world where the community belief is so strong that people do things always together as a family, as a unit. And again, it's just different. And I teach, um, I teach at Rutgers University in New Jersey and I teach a public speaking class. And what I love about that class, it's only, it's limited to 25 students per section. And I teach two sections of it. And I have students from literally all over the world, from China, from um, the UAE, from Texas, from California and New Jersey. I mean, they're from all over the place. And getting those students in a room, talking about who they are, what they believe in and kind of their why, 
is so incredibly fascinating. And especially for the students that are from the US, hearing from people from other parts of the world, what they believe in and their why is sometimes just jaw dropping. Um, I had a student last spring who was from, he was from Kenya. And I'd, be, I'd actually been to Kenya the year before for, for something for my daughter. Um, so I was very fortunate that I understood um, kind of where he came from a little bit and, and, and his belief system. But he was from a, a tribal community in Kenya, you know, in, in, on the Masamara. And the, the students in the class <clears throat> who were from, you know, the United States who grew up in an air conditioned house with, you know, mm -hmm. Wi-Fi running water and electricity. Yeah. It was very, very different from the student who grew up in this tribal community on the Masamara, where literally they are in clay huts with, you know, one source for running water for that community and no electricity. And Wi-Fi is like something you get when you go into the local town. It's very different. And this was 2023. Right. So part of that, part of that just sharing stories helps us as people appreciate difference and significance and hopefully gaining a greater appreciation for other people's why and sometimes that can expand our belief system which i think is wonderful and great and so in in, in whether i'm you know teaching a class coaching students um giving a lecture at a at a women's group or or a you know for some sort of consulting firm or something I always want to understand people's why, and I always want to understand their story. And I can't ask everybody that same question, but even when I just, you know, have a room of two or 300 people, have two or three people share their story and share their why, you can tell there's this enlightenment that happens just kind of across the room. And there's a certain, I don't know, humility and wow that also comes with that, which I just love seeing. And Again, that's part of communication, and that's part of the reason that I'm so fascinated by it. But uh, you have transitioned from corporate communication to academia and coaching. What yes. What prompted the shift, and how has that influenced your current approach right now? So the shift was not intentional. Um, we were living in New York City, and I, my, for my husband's job, we had to move to upstate New York. And I got there and thought I would just, continue doing PR because I had come off of, you know, several years of working for big agencies like Edelman, Weber, Shannon, Wick and Ogilvy. And then I had worked for a couple of uh, companies. I took a company public on the New York Stock Exchange. I was having so much fun and I loved it. And my position, um, I had worked for a satellite company, a company called Pan Amsat. And uh, that position, we got acquired. So everything got merged and my position got eliminated. So that's why that job ended. But that was, for me, that was such a fun job. Um, I still miss it. But anyway, so we moved out of New York and up out of the city, and um, I found myself overqualified. So I was a very senior person in a very in a smaller region that didn't have the number of PR jobs that were in New York. And so, and I I well, I, I enjoy working a lot. Um, and so for me, uh, I needed to figure out something else to channel my energy into. And somebody said, and a fellow PR person actually up there. Said you should teach college, and I was like, ah. Oh. And the reason I made that grimace with the time was because both of my parents are PhDs um, and had taught co taught college, and um, I, I was like, oh my god, I can't do that. That's what my parents do. But I did, and my first class was public speaking, and it was at a local community college. Um, and my first day, my first class, got up in front of the room and introduced myself, and I just kind of felt like. This is what I should be doing. Like I found my, I found my passion, and I get a little teary eyed talking about it because it really, it really was like I was like, oh my god, like this is what I'm supposed to do with my life, and it was like a, we'll call it like a, a lightning bolt moment. So, I we were we were upstate for four years, so I taught for four years. Um, I adjuncted at a bunch of colleges, and then we moved. We were fortunate to move back down to the New York area. And I just continued teaching. So I continued with the public speaking and I have been at Rutgers since 2013. Um, so public speaking is what I've taught the longest. I've been teaching it since 2009. 
And then um, <clears throat> along the way, I've been teaching a lot of PR courses, PR writing courses, media courses, communication, basically uh, everything underneath the communications umbrella. Um, I've worked as full-time faculty. Uh, I had a five-year appointment um, at Seton Hall running the undergraduate PR program. Um, and that's something that I, that I chose to step away from because I wanted to focus more on public speaking for myself. So um, I was at Seton Hall until July of last year and um, left that job. And that was hard because I loved, I loved that job. I loved the students. I loved the university. Um, I loved my colleagues, but it was, it was, it, there was a huge time commitment associated with it, which I, which is just part of how an academic appointment is. Um, and I realized I had been doing some uh, oh, my own public speaking, talking to women's groups, um, doing some consulting um, on the side. And that was so much fun. And so I realized that like, I still want to teach students, but I also want to be able to do the consulting projects and work with women's groups because I, I love being able to help other women. And I can do that as a professor, but I can do it even more as a professor and a, and a coach and a mentor and a lecturer and all that in other places. So I stepped away from the full-time appointment um, and now I adjunct at a bunch of universities um, in New Jersey and, and Rutgers is the one that I've been the longest at. Um, and I also teach at a few other schools, Montclair State, William Patterson and um, NJCU, which is New Jersey City University. And then, in, and that's about, I would say about 50% of my time. And then in my non-academic time, I mentor high school students and college students. I do a lot of um, speaking to women's groups and I work with a lot of female founders, female uh, entrepreneurs um, on helping them figure out the messaging and the positioning for their companies. Um, as they're starting to raise their initial capital. And I'm, I have to say, I'm loving what I do right now because I'm in the classroom and I'm in, I'm in industry and I'm, I've got my, my toes, shall we say, in, in both areas. And it's so fun, but more importantly, it's so fulfilling. And I think for me, as I said, when I started, first started teaching, I had that recognition, like this was what I was meant to do. You know, this was my passion. This was, you know, I discovered something I actually love doing. And I've always said that like, you know, once you find that, that thing, you need to be able to figure out how to embrace it and leverage it and, and just enjoy it. And I thoroughly enjoy, thoroughly enjoy teaching, thoroughly enjoy lecturing and love mentoring. And so for me, it's been a lot of work to figure out kind of that balance um, but I, I feel like I've gotten there. Um, and I'm very, very happy to be able to say that. Um, and I think that for all of us, it takes, it's hard to, to look inside and it's hard to leave something that you loved. And I, I loved, I loved my full-time appointment at Seton Hall. It was something I had dreamed of doing. And the fact that I had the opportunity to do it for five years. I'm blessed by, I truly am. Um, but I also knew that there was this passion and desire to be able to do more um, with, like I said, with working with female entrepreneurs, with mentoring students outside of, uh, the, of the university. So um, it took a lot. It took a lot for me. It took a lot to leave something that I loved, but it was the right decision. Um, and I, I, I don't regret it. Um, and I feel like I'm now able to take that energy, some of that energy that I used in, in, in my responsibilities there, and I'm able to channel it into other things. And it's, for me, it's been really exciting to see where things have gone. Is that what led you to found presenting um, perfection? perfection? So yeah, so I started presenting perfection uh, back in 2006. Um, and it was the, the reason it started was because my kids were little back then. And I realized that they were specifically my son, they were being asked to do a lot of presentations in, in the classroom and the core curriculum, which is what was being used in, in their classes there, um, didn't allow for teachers to be able to teach things that were outside of the core. So putting together a, a speech or a book report or in-class presentation was not, the teachers just didn't have it in their time. 
um, allocation. So I decided to start it. And originally the focus was on working with little kids. But what became quickly apparent to me was that there was a need for parents as well. So over the years, I've, I say I work with people from eight to 108. But um, it is, I do start with kids that are eight years old, students that are eight years old, because they know how to write. And you really need to be able to write or keyboard to be able to put together a like, some talking points for a little speech, and then going from there. Um, so I do everything from working with kids on public speaking to coaching high school students for college interviews, to working with college students on internship and, and job interviews, to working with executives on uh, presentations and speeches and, and team management. That's another area I've gotten into is, you know, if you're an executive, how do you manage your team? Um, how do you do it in a way that's motivating? Um, and that's not, you know, muffling or, or stifling their, their progress. Um, so it, it, communication is such an incredibly important skill. And we're seeing more and more of that yeah. um, as we evolve as a society. So pretty much everything you do right now fell under that, that company itself. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I teach about 50% of my time I spend teaching. And then 50% of my time I spend um, with the working with, with people. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, love, I love both. <laughs> As an author of three textbooks on public relationships, what inspired you to write them? It was on my list of things to do. Um, I, uh, I'm a big believer in making, in setting goals and milestones and making lists. And for me, um, I just wanted to do it. I, I, and, and COVID came, right? So I didn't have a whole lot going on, like most of us. I didn't have a lot going on during COVID. So I was like, all right, let me take the time to write a book. And the first book, was, it was supposed to be one book. Um, and it was supposed to be a big book on public relations, and which evolved. But we, I had this international component where I interviewed people um, from around the world on how the PR industry was changing. And we got an incredible number of responses. So what we did was we took those responses and made them their own book. That's called mm. um, Public Relations, The Changing Global Landscape. And then... The, the big book, as I always call it, The Practice of Public Relations, is a 14-chapter book along with case studies that were actually written by my students um, on the world of public relations. And we look at everything from the evolution of the industry to um, the areas that public relations affects within an organization. So everything from investor relations and employee communications to community relations. And I wrote the book from the perspective being of, of being a PR person and working inside an organization. So in other words, if you're head of corporate communications for a large multinational, wh what are the areas that you affect? Who are the people that you work with? Um, and it, it, you know, it took a lot of time and a lot of focus, but I'm, it was incredibly exciting to get that out and get it published. Um, and yeah, so I've done the three books and, People keep asking me, when's the fourth? <laughs> like, well, yeah, when is the I, fourth? I, 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 well, the, and I don't think the fourth, the fourth won't be a textbook. Um, the fourth is going to be, there will be a fourth, but the fourth is going to be a book more focused on uh, communicate, just general communication, but specifically women and um, leadership skills. Like because, as I, yeah, as we were talking earlier, I find it fascinating. And, um, I am so involved in working with women, talking with women um, of all different areas and experience bases and, and, and industries on a daily basis about the challenges that they face that um, I'd very much like to, to do a book on that and talk about, again, skills that we all need to navigate oh. um, from the corporate, you know, from the boardroom to, to, to the playground and talking to other moms and other, and other men and, and to men. And I, I think that there's, there's a huge opportunity there. So that, that's kind of what I'm, I'm thinking about right now. Or it would be called the power of you, which is the idea that we are all like in my world, you stands for your own understanding and um, that you would use your own skill set to understand who you are and um, just, you know, in, enhance yourself. And from a recent experience that I've been through, um, I know that the, the, the power of, of the individual um, is really, really important. Um, I contracted a, a very, 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 um, bizarre disease or illness called toxic shock syndrome, which is something that women are familiar with because it's, there's disclosures on the side of the tampon box, but that is not how I got it. 
um, I can basically got strep A and they don't really know where I got it. Um, but that caused my body to contract toxic shock, to go into toxic shock, which I should say. So this happened back in March um, and I've been battling it ever since. Um, and I'm happy to say I'm like pretty much over the hump. Um, but when I checked into the hospital, I had 10% heart function. I had multi-symptom organ oh. failure. All my organs were crashing and I survived. Um, and the survival rate, given how sick I was, was about 3%. Um, so it has been a journey. It's been and it's not, yeah. And it's not one that I would wish on anybody. Um, but I've gotten through it. And I think, you know, yeah, I'm going to be all right. And that's the important thing. And um, I'm not unscathed, but I'm for for 98% kind of back to where I was. And um, that article that I mentioned earlier that I wrote was actually about the experience and kind of what I went through. And I know that had I not had the internal fortitude and the commitment to just getting better, that I wouldn't have got better. Yeah. And, you know, someone, one of the actually, one of the female entrepreneurs that I coach, her, her saying is there's no option for failure and with her company. And I have to, and I saw her a few weeks ago, Maggie, and I said to her, you know what, your credo is what I adopted for myself when getting through all of this. It's like, there is no option for failure because there isn't. And um, it has been just a bizarre life experience, but you know, I woke up in a hospital bed, not knowing how I had gotten there, told and told through various doctors and family members what had happened to me. And it's just kind of like, I mean, it was like a, I mean, honestly, it was a nightmare um, to realize and wake up how sick I had been and kind of the challenges that I faced. But I knew I could do it. Um, and I'm not going to say it's been easy. And I'm not going to say that I haven't had moments where I've really lost it because I have. But Catherine, um, it's not supposed to be easy. If it's easy, no, then, it's not. No, it's supposed to be hard sometimes because you know what? I, I feel like God will test us sometimes. How strong yes. are you? Are you capable of handling it? Let's try you. And that's right. You have done so many things in this world already. This is nothing. This is just a small little thing. And you're supposed to go through it. You're supposed to stand like a champ. And you're supposed to go out there and tell other people that they can do it too. And that is your job. And you're not supposed to fail. You're supposed to go through it and fight it and then come out of it stronger than ever. And that's exactly what's happening right now. So don't get me wrong. Yeah. There's time you're going to go cry. It's okay to cry. It's okay to scream. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Well, and crying is part of the process, right? Because yes. if we don't allow ourselves to be sad... Then, then what are we doing? And again, it goes to that whole power of you thing. Um, so mm -hmm. the more I talk, I think that to you, I think that's going to be the book um, because it it is, you know, I tell this, I told the story to people. Not, not I haven't broadcast it a lot because I don't want this to become a pity party for Catherine because it certainly should not be. But the people I have told have been just overwhelmed, like shocked, you know. Um, and they're like, you have to share this. So part of the reason I wrote that article was as that first step. Um, cause I, I want it to empower people. I, I don't want it to make people sad. I don't want people to, Oh, poor Catherine. Like, I don't want that. Like, that's not what, like, to your point, like it happened. I'm getting through it. I'll get through it. And then we move on. And, exactly. and, and I've learned a lot about myself. But I've learned a hell of a lot about society and people and compassion. And, and you know, the, the, the bright side of all of this is, boy, compassion is alive and well. And I'm blessed. I'm so blessed by the people in my life, my family, my friends, my community, you know, um, on how supportive everybody has been. And I feel like I got like a little sneak peek into stuff that a lot of people don't. And I'm forever grateful for that because I think that, you know, there's always the saying like, you know, the glass is half empty or half full. And I was always a glass half full person anyway. But going into this now, I was so fortunate that I came out in the way that I did. And um, there was a there was another person in the hospital, the exact same hospital that actually I would I was in when I was there who died of the exact same thing. And that really gives you perspective. Um, yeah. 
It wasn't your time. You're supposed to That's learn right. something from this and you're supposed to go That's pass right. it on. Let others know it's okay. They can go through it. Exactly. You know, one, one thing I believe in, uh, Catherine, is the fact that when we are sick, we have all these things going on. It's not just medications, anything like that, that's going to make us survive, but also it's the will. Yes. How much do you want to live? And how that's far right. are you going to go to stay strong to survive? Do you want that's to right. survive or not? And if the will is there, you're willing to survive and you don't want to die, you will continue to live. And I believe in that. And I don't get me wrong, the doctors play the roles on it, but you need to play your part as well. If the doctors That's are playing right. the roles and you're just sitting there like, oh, well, this is it for me. I'm done. Oh, okay, it's time to arrange my own funerals. If you just keep talking like that, you're just telling yourself you want to die. No. Well, that's right. That. That's right. That's Shut right. Up and keep on going. Well, that's right. And the, the kind of the mantra, apart from like, there's no option for failure that I've adopted is like, if I don't do it, I won't do it. Right. So I had somebody at th- an occupational therapist at the house yesterday who came to see me just to check in and, and he was like, well, what are you having problems with? And I'm like, nothing really. I mean, because I said, I don't let my, I, I, I'm doing stuff, you know, I'm pushing myself to do things. Um, because if I don't, I won't. And he laughed yeah. because I wish everybody would view it that way, but it's true. Like, and yeah. it's that way in business too, is that, you know, if you, have an inkling to do something, try it. You know, you asked me about the books. Well, I wanted to do it. So I did it. Um, yes. You know, there have been I, teaching was one of those things, like I mentioned, I kind of fell into, but it was always something that I'd been curious about because of my, because of my parents. And had I not, I, as I always say, as I not tried, I wouldn't have given myself the opportunity to grow and learn. The permission, and, yes. You know, worst case you fail. So what if you fail? I think failure is amazing. It's a um, part of life. You're supposed to learn, you know? It is. It is. That's right. That's right. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, for me, um, in kind of in totality and looking at like the career, um, the community and and kind of this recent crazy experience that I've had, I, I my big takeaway with all of this is it is so important to believe in yourself and it is so important to, to not overthink things yeah. and to just do. And if you screw up along the way, or if you fail from your own perspective, who cares? It is part of the growing process, part of the aging process. And, you know, with age definitely comes wisdom. Like I, there are definitely things that I think about now that I did in my twenties and thirties. I'm like, Oh my God, why did I do that? But like, I learned from it. And, um, you know, and I always try to share those stories with my students or my kids. My kids definitely don't listen. Sometimes my students do. Um, but it, it just, you know, you need to let yourself be you. You need to let yourself discover who you are. And, and if you're afraid to be you, then, then it's really going to be challenging. Oh, yes. So for me, I knew when I woke up in that hospital bed and didn't know where I was or how I had gotten there. I knew I was going to be okay. So I just knew it was going to take time. Yeah, and we're so, now four months. Yesterday was the four month uh, anniversary of my contracting toxic shock. So it, it comes kind of a big milestone around here. So anyway. <laughs> You're going to be fine. And I have no doubts about that. You are a strong woman. And uh, I'm pretty sure you've been through a lot more than that. Sometimes we don't remember them because they, they happen in childhood. And we have our mother, our fathers to be there to support us, right? But in adulthood, it's kind of like, okay, I got to be strong for myself while other people are being strong for me too. So you are going to be just fine. So now how can people reach out to you? Um, Feel free. There's a couple of ways you can get a hold of me. So LinkedIn um, and then my company website is just uh, presentingperfection.com. And through that website or just, again, through email, you can contact me. So, you know, the easiest thing to do is just Google search me. It'll bring up all my, all my information. You can check out my background. Um, The websites all come up. Um, Find me on LinkedIn, um, shoot me a note through LinkedIn messaging. um, And I would love to chat with people. And if people are interested in communications coaching, right up my alley. And I always offer a free 30 minute conversation with people. And then um, I put together a customized package to help people navigate um, their communications challenges. Um, so well, would love to talk to anyone that has any interest. 
Well, thank you so much, Catherine. I appreciate the time you've given me to have this conversation with you. Not only that, I see a part of you that maybe some people haven't seen, the true yeah. person behind Catherine, which is you. Um, <laughs> There's no hiding part, a... really. It's like when you're there talking, you, you, can, you can see the passion, you can feel it, and you can see it at the same time. Like it's showing oh. that you have a passion for this and you love to support others, to help them understand themselves and to communicate better. And that's something I I've seen on you. And I appreciate you, you giving them information, things that they can learn from, because you know what? You are made in this world to learn and pass it on. And I appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to Female Founders Podcast. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app or connect with us on warmail.com so that you don't miss our next episode. See you next time. Bye for now.